don't feel like Italian. <laughs> where'd you go? Hey, come on. Hey, where'd you go? Oh, hey, come on. You gotta work with me here. I'm just trying to cut a D. What do you want me to do? Where are you? You bunch of losers! You're working with a professional here! <laughs> Nice model. Uh, little column A, little column B. First of all, I just want to tell you what a great show you got. I listen to you all the time. Thank you, thank you. What do you want to talk about? Hey, did I tell you guys I got a goat? Yeah, baby. <laughs> well, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are, whatever you do. A lot of weird things happening in the world today. Most of them are far beyond our control, you might say. So perhaps it's time we took a pause and thought about life and thought about the laws of gravity, weird people, cannibalism, 17th century Dutch politics, anti-federalism, current politics, and or the news. Don't touch that dial. Just try to hear me out for a little while. Some days, well, you know how my mind works. Let's just be generous and say oddly. So while I was working slowly on show prep for today, I had to take a trip out into the rain to a place that I just never go where I met people who struck me as odd. That should tell you something. That got me thinking about 17th century Dutch politics and anti-federalism, and that led to cannibalism. How you uh, hear you cry? Hold on to your butts. What else is new, am I right? Here's how you get a hold of me. The text machine is area code 209-565-DAVE. It's 209-565-3283. The email, dave at thedavebowmanshow.com. And of course, we're on the web. Just use your preferred non-denominational web search browser to take you to plausiblylive.com or thedavebowmanshow.com. They're the same. Or just look for The Dave Bowman Show on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, and SoundCloud. Ego Biberi Capula said olive verb. I drink coffee so that other people might live. So, I was having a conversation yesterday, born out of some of my frustrations, with a good friend of mine, about, well, really about being my own worst critic in a lot of ways, but one of the things that this person said to me was, you know, you let people see how your mind works. I'm not really sure that I do. So I thought, well, today, as I was doing show prep for today, um, I thought, well, maybe I should let people into my mind for just a bit and see how things are going. Hang on one sec. Forgot to turn the fan off. Sorry. That's going to drive me nuts. Anyway, the point being that, uh, okay, so today is Johann DeWitt's birthday. Now, you, you may know who Johann DeWitt is. You may not know who Johann DeWitt is. If you are a uh, Constitutional Thursday, Constitution Thursday person, you should know because once upon a time, we actually did an, uh, 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 an episode, Who is John DeWitt? John DeWitt was an anti-federalist who wrote a series of letters in opposition to the ratification of the Constitution. Some of the, I would call them some of the better arguments against the Constitution's ratification were written by this character, John DeWitt. And of course, nobody knew who he was. There's some suspicions and all that kind of stuff. But if you recall, both the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers all used pen names, pseudonyms that were based in historical characters that appealed to their particular mindset, I guess, is the best way to see it. And John DeWitt, of course, took on the, the name of Johann DeWitt, who was born this day, a long time ago in the 1600s, maybe even the 1500s. I don't remember his exact birthday, but, but uh, jo- Johann DeWitt was one of the leaders, as it were, of the Dutch Confederacy, the Dutch Republic, which, of course, figures significantly in the Federalist Papers as they talk about why confederations don't work and why we need to get out of a confederation like we have and into this centralized Federalist Union as opposed to a confederation. And all that, you know, I mean, we talked about that at great length on Constitution Thursday one day. And so it was in the middle of all this that I had to go out. And I I didn't really want to go out. I got to be honest with you. It was pouring rain yesterday. 
it's Washington, it's fall, of course it's raining, and I got to go out and I got to go to a place that I don't like to go. In fact, I think in my entire life I've been there twice, including yesterday. And if yesterday is any example of <laughs> why I don't like to go there, I will not be going back anytime soon. I found myself at this place here in town, and that's a picture actually taken shortly after the events that I'm about to describe to you. Because even as I walked back to my car and got in and got ready to go on to the next place because this place didn't have what, what we were looking for, um, even then I was still shaking my head a little bit going, did that really happen? Really? Weirdness just happens, I guess, in places like this. So I pull up there, I get out, and next to me is a is a guy, uh, well, in the, in the car, literally right behind me, is a guy who gets out at the same time. And it is pouring rain. You can't really tell from the picture, but it is pouring rain. And but it's it's just that far to the to the door so i'm not going to put on my jacket for that i'm just uh, why so i get out of the car and i start walking but i have to wait for this gentleman to go because he's getting out of the car and pulling on his freaking parka i mean he has nanook of the north parka complete with hood you know fur trim the whole nine yards and he starts walking in front of me towards the towards the store there as we get to the crosswalk i notice his footwear and i'm not trying to be you know weird or anything i i don't normally look at people's feet to judge their footwear it's not what i'm doing i just happen to be looked down and i i notice that he's wearing well it's germane to the story so we'll get there in a minute at any rate there's a crosswalk now i have a a, a belief about crosswalks and I, I call my crosswalk belief the real politic. The real politic, of course, was established by Bismarck back in the 1890s. And it's this idea that political realism or practical politics, especially a policy based on power rather than ideals. What it means is, as Bismarck said, politics is the art of the possible, not, uh, not just, you know, <laughs> crazy things. So uh, there's, this, there's this idea here that, you got to do what's you know what's realistic not what not necessarily what you want to do when you enter the crosswalk which you can see in the picture behind me there technically i have the right away as a pedestrian right i mean everybody agrees it's a crosswalk we have the right away but as we walk closer to this crosswalk and we're getting ready to head out through this crosswalk the park gentleman in front of me who by this point is mumbling to himself um doesn't even look i mean he just he just keeps going and it's at this point as i'm about to step into the crosswalk behind him that i notice the old woman in the van uh old woman man she was probably in her 50s but she was focused man she was focused you need to understand what i'm saying here she wasn't talking on her phone she wasn't fiddling with the radio she wasn't yelling at the kids in the back none of that she had her hands on the wheel and she was focused because she was going that way. And I don't really know where else she was. She wasn't speeding or anything, but she wasn't doing five miles an hour either. She was probably going a little little bit faster than, than I would in a parking lot. But, you know, to each their own. And she was, she was going. And it was intuitively obvious to me, as I started to put my foot into that crosswalk, that this woman was not going to stop. Okay, you with me here? She was not going to stop. And into my mind flashed my policy of crosswalks, crosswalks, which is the real politic, which is that it's political realism based on power rather than ideals. It might, in fact, be my right of way to go into that crosswalk. In fact, I could probably step into that crosswalk, raise my hands and say, look at me. This is my crosswalk. Aren't I wonderful? But the real politic of the situation is that even as big as I am, and unfortunately I'm much bigger than I would like to be, that van moving at the speed speed it was with a really focused woman, I mean, focused, uh, yeah, I'm not going to win that fight. 
And as you already know, I live my life in pain, and I really didn't want to, really don't want to have any more pain. So the real politic of the situation is, hmm, I guess she can go. She's determined to go, and I'm going to let her go. And it's at this point in the pouring rain with the guy with the parka with the fur trimmed head and the Birkenstocks on his feet. Yes, it's pouring rain. He's wearing Birkenstocks with no socks. It, it's at this point that I notice that he speeds up. The van is now literally almost in front of him. So it's not going to hit him, but he speeds up. And of course, boom, hits the van as hard as he can and starts screaming. <laughs> okay, dude, the van did not hit you. I get it. You're making your point, which is that the woman, the focused woman, is not paying attention to anything. I get it. I get it. I understand that. And, uh, you know, had the situation been somewhat different, I mean, I did kind of wave my hands a little bit and go, hey, <laughs> You know, we're here, crosswalk. I made the crosswalk motion, and she didn't, because she was focused. She didn't see me. So the van stops, of course. And crazy guy with the park and the fur trim and the Birkenstocks, he just, I mean, he just goes berserk. I mean, he's just like yelling at her, and she's terrified because she, she's so focused. She has no clue what she's done. She really doesn't realize that she just blew through a crosswalk at, you know, probably twice the speed limit of the of the parking lot and could have she probably didn't see anybody because she was focused but she could have created some problems right but the real politic of it is i'm not getting in front of her because it's just not worth making my point that she's wrong isn't worth more pain to me it's just not and this guy just <laughs> up one side down the other of course now she's panicked because she thinks the crazy guy is going to eat her children so she speeds off because <laughs> she's scared i mean i would i can't blame her at that point you know it's like okay dude um yeah she's wrong but you're you're overreacting to the situation here it wh what you're doing is really not necessary you could have just said hey you need to pay better attention but no he, he went off on her and of course she's got the windows up because she don't want to hear it and he's just weird dude so after she pulls off by this point i'm actually across the crosswalk and stop to you know now I'm, my, my mind is okay <laughs> whose side am i on in this and i don't know at this point because you know granted the woman the focused woman was she was wrong but the crazy guy m might be he might be wackadoodle he might do something really stupid, and so I'm, I'm kind of this is, this is this is crazy. Van speeds off. I thought he was going to chase it for a second, but he didn't. He looks at me and says, and he, he looks at me now, <laughs> standing there watching this, knowing that I had followed him across the crosswalk. He looks at me and starts yelling at me. Where is your jacket? Where is your coat? Don't you realize it's raining outside? What is wrong with you? And I thought to myself, the real politic of the situation is this dude's crazy. This dude is, this dude's nuts. And I could uh, sit here and argue with him. I could sit here and go, dude, what, dude, what is wrong with you? Have a Snickers. You're not yourself or whatever. But I thought, you know, I just, I just don't need this. I don't even want to be here in the pouring rain but here I am, and so I might as well just go in and do what it is that I'm going to go in and do. So I walk inside with this guy screaming at me because I'm not wearing a coat. The dude wearing a parka, by the way, it's 60 degrees out. It's just raining, and it is raining pretty heavily, and he's wearing Birkenstocks with no socks. He's yelling at me because I don't have a coat to walk, what, 30 feet? <sighs> anyway, I go inside, and... <laughs> They don't have what what I came. I already told you that part. They don't have what I came to get. So 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 this has already been a bust, except for these these Halloween decorations. It's not even October yet. Halloween, of course, is at the end of the 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 next month. But Halloween decorations are already out, along with Christmas decorations, by the way. But um, anyway, I, I I saw these, and of course, they made me think of my wife, whom I love 
very dearly and is always telling me about how she's never going to remarry when I die, which is kind of creepy. But at any rate, <laughs> she's, I saw these, and so I started taking pictures of them. And as I was taking pictures of these to send to my, my beloved wife, whom I love with all my heart, um, crazy dude w- walks up behind me again and starts screaming at me about taking pictures of the decorations. I'm like, what is, I better get out of here. So I made my, my beeline out back to the car where I stopped to take this picture and look at, get back in the car and go on to the next place, which hopefully, which fortunately did not have as many crazy people as, as this particular store did on this particular day as I was trying to do show prep in my head while paying attention to all this stuff. So what does all this have to do with anything you're saying? Well, this is where my mind is when I, when I finally got back home to sit down to start working on show prep for today, which was, it wasn't really hard. You know, I mean, it's Johan DeWitt's birthday. Johan DeWitt, again, the, the Dutch uh, leader who, who once upon a time took over the Dutch uh, confederation. He was um, elected as the, uh, the leader of the portion, the province, I guess, of, of the Dutch confederation known as Holland. And what you need to know about Johan de Witt was he was, well, he was a vehement anti-royalist. He uh, had actually, through a long set of circumstances, actually ended up making a, an agreement with, with Oliver Cromwell to make sure that the, the crown prince of, of Holland, the House of Orange, never became actually a royalty again that's it's a fascinating tale i mean the the whole when you start looking at the whole history of 17th century dutch politics it's bizarre i mean you're, you're dealing with this confederation that is dominated by holland but it's all these other little states like belgium and Liechtenstein, and they didn't call them that back then freeland and zealand and all this other stuff stuff that would have eventually become the netherlands but it's 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 a confederation, which of course is what the framers and the writers of the uh, the the Federalist Papers keep telling us about. This is the most recent confederation that we have in in world history, and we can tell you all about it. And and they proceed to tell you why confederations don't work, and and they're right about everything because what ends up happening to Johann De Witt is nothing short of bizarre. I mean, this guy. He, he runs Holland and essentially the, the Dutch Confederacy for nearly 20 years, he and his brother. But he is such an anti-royalist and such a, to borrow our terminology, anti-federalist, that he absolutely abhors the idea of a standing army. In fact, he, uh, he refuses to pay for the Dutch for the Dutch to have a standing army. He refuses to pay for it. He, he runs the whole thing. He is not, in fact, technically the, the leader. He's not the prince or whatever, the stadtholder. But because Holland is the most powerful of all the provinces in the Confederacy, what he says kind of goes. And while the, other, while the other provinces actually vote to have a, a stadtholder in, in Prince uh, Willie, he refuses to do it. He he will not go along with it. And because he won't go along with it, there's a lot of friction between the royalists and the anti-federal anti-royalists, or what we would call anti-federalists, right? He refuses to pay for this army, but he builds a navy. He builds a navy that's second to none. In fact, this navy, and this is one of those things that people don't realize about history, this Dutch navy that DeWitt builds actually kicks England's butt for times four times the english royal navy you know created by uh, elizabeth and and maintained by england and you know hail britannia and all that the same navy that's going to you know mess up uh napoleon here pretty soon that same navy uh he kicks their butt four times four times they come over and say well we're going to invade you and four times the Dutch Navy, led by a guy by the name of De Ruder, uh, says, no, you're not. And they absolutely kick them out of the English and end up, uh, because, of the, because of these four naval battles that they fight against the English that they win, they end up surrendering, the Dutch do, 
they won the battles, but they end up surrendering and giving the English, as part of the settlement for kicking their butts, they give them um, New Amsterdam in the, in the New World, in the New Colonies, which, of course, you know today is New York. Is all this making sense to you? Right? Where's he going with this? Where, what does this have to do with anything? I hear you cry. What does this have to do with a crazy guy with a park and Birkenstocks screaming at people at Michael's? Well, I watch our politics today, and I, and, 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 I, and I know, like many of you, it's easy to get passionate about it. It really is. It's easy to get fired up about 16-year-olds and Ukrainians and all that crap. And we just don't even realize how bizarre it has to look to somebody looking from outside the frame, looking at this going, these people are just freaking weird, dude. These people are messed up in the head. These people are wearing a parka with fur-lined hood in the rain with Birkenstocks kind of crazy. They're yelling at people kind of crazy in, in stores for looking at Halloween decorations kind of crazy. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of people we're dealing with here. That's what we've become because we're like, what the hell is all this about? Anyway, I was bemused as I was reading about all this because there is so little about 17th century Dutch politics available in the history books. I mean, there is some out there, but, but, but even Will Durant in his magnum opus, The Story of Civilization, basically bypasses the whole thing. He makes a side reference to what will happen to Mr. DeWitt in the end, but that's a, literally about it. He just, there's just no, so you have to go all do all this other stuff to figure out what happened in history to these guys and why, why the anti-federalists of the United States were so fascinated by him. And one of the things that they loved about Johann DeWitt was that he was against royalist centralized power. He was very much a confederation guy. And he, he just absolutely hated the idea of a standing army. And so, if you read a lot of the anti-federalist literature, and as I've said on many occasions today, the libertarian movement, which I believe to be the ideological grandchild of the anti-federalists, you get a lot of anti-militarism, anti-army, anti-standing army type mentality from them. And, and it comes straight from Johann DeWitt. It comes straight from his ideology in Holland and running Holland in the 1650s to 1670s, the 17th century confuses the hell out of me but it shouldn't but it does at any rate it's this anti-standing army thing that actually ends up being the undoing of of mr dewitt because what happens is the british and french decide the british decide after after they've been beaten by the dutch four times and after the dutch in in i guess uh you know, because the Dutch won, the Dutch surrendered, gave them New Amsterdam, which becomes New York. The British kind of figure that's not enough. So they get their French allies. Yes, I said French allies to join them to invade Holland. And of course, Holland has no standing army. The problem is it's dead of winter time. And so it's not going, it's not going as well as you would think it would go. But the British and French are winning. And this pisses off the people who are anti-Federalists, pro-Royalists in Holland and in the rest of the Dutch Confederacy. They get mad about all this. And they find DeWitt's brother, Cornelius DeWitt, who is one of the military leaders of the country, as such as it is. And they arrest him for treason because they're losing. Because they don't have an army. Right? <laughs> They're getting beaten because they don't have an army. They throw him in prison, and they try to kill Johann DeWitt. They attack him. Uh, they, send a, they send an assassin who stabs him and hurts him very badly. And because he's hurt so badly, he resigns his leadership role and basically stays home. Well, as it turns out, his home is literally right next door to the prison where his brother is being held. Literally right next door to that little building right there in this famous painting. And... He goes to visit him. He decides, well, I'm going to go visit my brother because he's, his, his penalty is exile. So I'm going to go help him start his his voyage out of the Netherlands, out of Holland. I'll say goodbye to my brother. And so he goes over there. And of course, the whole thing is a setup and a trap. And so now they have both of the DeWitt brothers. The royalists have both of them in the same place. They immediately arrest them and lynch them. Okay. They immediately kill both of them. And that's the famous painting, the death of the DeWitt brothers, being, the murder of the DeWitt brothers, being strung up, gibbeted, and uh, essentially disemboweled as, as they were there. 
This is the ending of of Mr. DeWitt, such as it was, which is not even where the weirdness ends by any stretch of the imagination. So the royalists did this. There's this pretend that this is a, a riot of some sort, but of course it's so well organized and so well behaved that nobody believes that it's any kind of spontaneous anything this is planned it is structured it is just like a 16 year old reading her speech in front of the united nations kind of structure right so they chop up the dewitt brothers having taken them down from the gibbet and they proceed to eat them yeah you 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 heard that right If you remember, the Dutch ate on a grill the heart of the two brothers, DeWitt. If you will recall that the Republican John Calvin, after having written that we should not persecute any man, denied the Trinity, did it anyway. And you will conclude that there is no more virtue in republics than there is in monarchies. That's Voltaire in his saying of all this. And you start to realize that our politics today is freaking crazy. Our politics today is full of people who, you know, yell at you for wearing no coat while they're wearing Birkenstocks in the rain. It's full of people who will lecture you about how you should live your life because they've decided that you've somehow or another wronged them. They're so focused on what they want and where they're going, they're not paying any attention to anything else or anybody else that might be harmed or in their way or anything like that. You think our politics is weird? You think our politics is crazy? You think our people today are bizarre? At least we're not eating people, right? And as I'm reading all this, Ben says to me, why did they eat that guy? It's a little hard to explain 17th century Dutch politics to a nine-year-old. And he looked at me and he said, and I'm quoting, cannibalism is not cool. can't really argue with that i gotta get going take the time right now tell the people that matter in your life you love them very much you'd miss them if they weren't there don't pass up those opportunities you don't want to have that regret plausibly live i'm dave bowman this is my show the dave bowman show right here on the podcast 99 internet radio network will not be here tomorrow unless something weird happens i gotta work tomorrow so we'll be here tomorrow but we'll be back on thursday for constitution thursday so now you know how my mind works see you thursday everybody The Dave Bowman Show is a Slippery Fish Entertainment production for the Podcast 99 Internet Radio Network. For more information or to complain about how the show offended you, the text or voicemail number is 209-565-DAVE. For more information about the show, log on to thedavebowmanshow.com. Hey, I'm going to go do something productive. I'm going to go watch television.